So this video will explain some of the aspects of Jim Crow etiquette. So um, these went hand in hand with the Jim Crow laws, but unlike the Jim Crow laws, these aren't things that are like codified in any, any sort of law. They're just sort of the unwritten social rules for interactions between whites and African Americans at the time of Jim Crow. So here are some examples. Uh, a black male could not offer his hands to shake hands with a white male because it implied being socially equal. Um, and a black male could not offer his hand or any other part of his body to a white woman uh, because he might be accused of rape. Um, under no circumstances was a black male to offer to light the cigarette of a white female because that get gesture implied intimacy. Also, blacks were not allowed to show public affection towards each other in public, um, especially kissing, because it offended whites. Jim Crow etiquette had very strict ways um, for, you know, how they sort of maintained the social hierarchy. So one way is that blacks were introduced to whites, but never whites to blacks. So if you were, so, you know, when you're introducing two people, who you introduce to the other is somewhat arbitrary, but not if, not under Jim Crow etiquette. So if you're introducing a white person and a black person, you would address the white person. You would say, Mr. Peters, this is Charlie. Um, and notice also that in that introduction, who gets the, who gets addressed by their courtesy title, by Mr. That's the white person. Um, and who gets addressed just by their first name? That's the black person. So whites did not use courtesy titles of respect when referring to blacks. For example, Mr., Mrs., uh, Sir, ma'am. Instead, blacks were called by their first names only. Uh, now, blacks had to, had to use courtesy titles when referring to whites and were not allowed to call them by their first names or just by their last name. So, like, in the example, um, in the Ethics of Living Jim Crow, when Richard gets accused of calling one of the other workers just peas instead of Mr. Peas. Um, that showed familiarity because addressing somebody by just their last name um, is something that people do, you know, with like the friends or their social equals. Um, just like addressing them by their first name is something you do with a social equal. Okay. If a black person rode in a car driven by a white person, the black person sat in the back seat or the back of a truck. White motorists had the right of way at all intersections. So regardless of who got there first, the white motorist would have right of way. Blacks and whites were not supposed to eat together, and if they did eat together, whites were to be served first, and there was supposed to be some sort of partition between them. So we saw that that one, that particular one did get encoded into laws in the Jim Crow laws. So there were rules for when conversing with whites. There were special rules that African Americans had to follow when conversing with whites. So never assert or even intimate that a white person is lying. So we saw this again in the um, Ethics of Living Jim Crow and that same incident um, where Richard is accused of calling one of the workers Pease instead of Mr. Pease. He gets stuck in a bind there because he's going to be in trouble if he admits that he called Mr. Pease just Pease. He'll have broken one of the rules of Jim Crow etiquette. But if he says that he didn't do that, then he's asserting or intimating that the other white person, um, sorry, I forget his name at the moment, um, but, you know, the other worker that he, who was do, the one doing the accusing, that 
that person is lying. So he's stuck in a bind between these two aspects of the Jim Crow etiquette in that example. And of course, you know, the person who's doing the accusing knows all of this and is setting him up for this. Um, they were never to impute dishonorable intentions to a white person. They never could suggest that a white person is from an inferior class. Never lay claim to or overly demonstrate superior knowledge or intelligence. So we see this in the in the ethics of living Jim Crow, I think a little bit when, you know, they think that Richard, when he's trying to like learn more about uh, the business and how to um, do things, that they're asking if, he, if he's trying to get smart. Um, so they're worried that he is trying to become more knowledgeable or more intelligent, and so not staying in his place. Never curse a white person. Never laugh at a white person. And never comment upon the appearance of a white female. So these Jim Crow etiquette rules were enforced through violence and intimidation. So in, in the Rewald uh, reading, there's a quote. It says, violate the Jim Crow law and you go to jail or you get a fine or something like that. Um, violate the Jim Crow etiquette and you get worse than jail. You get killed um, or beat up. Um, but killed was a big thing. So lynching was one of the main ways that Jim Crow was enforced informally. So the Jim Crow etiquette could be enforced this way. Um, so in a this was a recent um, recent publication that came out um, that sort of uncovered, I think these are like higher numbers that have been previously reported. So it's a, it was a, it's a fairly new source of documentation on how much lynching there was. And so according to that source, there were 3,959 lynchings of black people in 12 southern states between 1877 and 1950. And so this is really important. And the Jim Crow etiquette, I think, in general, is, is really important because unlike the Jim Crow laws, this isn't something that can be legislated away. This is not something that's going to go away with the passing of the Civil Rights Acts. It's going to linger for a long time, and as Rewald points out, there there are still echoes of this even today. You know, so it's over fifty years ago um, that Jim Crow came to the end, and it still it still goes on. So it was a very serious thing then, and it's still serious.